Okay, so this is an interview on the 4th of August 2022 um, at uh, the Caroline Graveson building at Goldsmiths College. Um, and it's an interview with Cliff Pereira. Cliff, can you spell your name, please? The surname? Or well, I'm assuming <laughs> it's C L I F F. C L I, it's actually Clifford, but everybody on the scene calls me Cliff. So it's Clifford, C L I F F O R D, and Pereira, P E R E I R A. Great, thank you. Um, and Cliff will be talking to me, Rosie Oliver, and Paul Green here, uh, which I think is quite easy to spell. Um, and Paul, sorry, Paul. Um, and Paul is um, from uh, Avon Gardening. Um, and uh, the purpose of this interview um, is to um, find out from Cliff um, information for um, a project that Avon Gardening Bijou Stories are doing called Where To Now the Sequence Have Gone which documents the gay bars and communities that existed in the borough of Lewisham, particularly in the 70s, 80s and 90s. And it's part of a bigger programme called In Living Memory, A People's History of Post-War Lewisham. So that's the preamble. Um, uh, over to Paul. Okay. So shall I just launch into a couple of questions? Yeah, and then we can, if I ask something stupid, just talk to Josh. So um, I'd like to start by saying, when did you start going onto the scene in Lewisham? Oh, when did I start going onto the scene in Lewisham? Actually, quite late. Um, I really struggled with being gay, but more because my main struggle in my life was not being white and living in Britain. So, growing up, the sense of identity for me was layered and my sexual orientation was low on the priority list because I can hide who I am sexually, but I can't hide who I am physically, okay? So, um, I, I knew something was different about me, but I didn't know what. So, I went through life. Uh, in my 20s, I worked in a very male environment in the Middle East, almost like a, an army situation, eight guys living in one long hut, uh, very macho, uh, no real room to talk about sex. And when there was discussion about sex, it was about going to Bangkok or uh, aptly named, <laughs> or Manila or one of those places and having all these women available. So there was a lot of pressure to conform to that, which I struggled with. And so I tended to do my trips without my workmates. Um, and I also went out there and did kind of history research and things like that because I wasn't really interested in what was being sold to me. And it was only uh, after I came back to the UK, went to university in Northern Ireland, I was still conforming to that. So I had a, a string of girlfriends at the university. It was not particularly difficult because it was like almost four women to one man in Northern Ireland. Uh, and the Irish are very friendly. So, <laughs> so um, it wasn't a difficult situation, but I was never happy with whoever I was in a relationship with, but not sure why. And I came back to London uh, in 1990 uh, and started working in London. And I was first introduced to the gay scene by my gay boss, who realized that I was getting very drunk because I was struggling with coping with things. And as a result, turning up to work late or missing work or whatever, and so he took me to the brief encounter. And while he went to get his get our drink, somebody started to converse with me and asked me what I was into. And it was too much. And I totally flipped and left. And the next day, my boss was like very worried about me and like, oh, you know, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. And I said, no. I went home and I thought about it. And the way I reacted means that you touched a point there 
And so I just need to work on that. And then somebody told me, oh, go to Gran Canaria and you can have a wonderful holiday there and like explore your gay sexuality or whatever it is, whether you're bi or gay, whatever. And I went there and I, again, I found it a bit too much, especially when I opened the curtains to my villa once and found somebody lying naked in there, just sort of on my patio. And I opened the door and like, what are you doing here? I said, come and join me. I said, no, get away, you know, I'm not having any of this, you know. <laughs> um, so uh, it was steps. And I was totally unaware that there was a scene in Lewisham uh, until my housemate, um, who worked uh, as a postman, told me about it. Now, I suspect my housemate was by, but he never really talked about it. And I thought, really? There's this place in Lewisham? And he said, it's called the Queen's Arms, and it's a gay pub. Um, and, you know, he was talking quite openly about it. So I wandered into um, the, the Queen's Arms and uh, found, oh, this is not only is this a gay bar, it's in South East London. And uh, it's quite friendly. Uh, and that's how I met the whole community. So that was about 97. Was it? 96, 97 maybe, yeah. And was that when you started exploring your, your sexuality or had you already... I, I, by that point, I already made up my mind that I wasn't bi, but I was gay. Uh, but how to act on the gay scene was still... How to navigate the gay scene, how to uh, take note of the way people acted, the codes, if you like, of the scene was still quite difficult. Um, my boss had also taken me to a pub in Earl's Court and I remember walking in there and there were all these guys in leather and again I, it was just too much. Firstly they were all big guys, they were all older than me, at least the ones I saw and I wasn't actually aware that there was such a thing as a leather scene until then so it was again a little bit too much, too quickly, without... I think what I was missing is a mentor. Mm. And I have to say that uh, at that particular period of time, things like Pride were mentioned, but they weren't as big as they later became. But I couldn't see me in any of those things. Whenever I went to... Whenever I saw those on TV, they were all white. And they were mainly male, too. There were, there were very few women on those images, that the media coverage. Uh, and to be honest, uh, even in pubs in central London, uh, you never saw black or Asian people on the scene. So I, I struggle with that a lot because I found... Um, I felt an oddity on the scene. I felt like I could be here, but not completely. And there were things that were said which I didn't like as well. Like I remember going to a place called the Attic Bar in, um, it's in theater land. It's, uh, it's opposite Rules, the uh, restaurant. I think it's the oldest restaurant in London, right? Um, and I, I went in there, so this bar was upstairs, and it was tiny, but everybody who worked in theatre land knew it, and they would all like sneak upstairs. And it was quite friendly, because it was just like a normal bar. It wasn't like the brief encounter. It wasn't targeting a certain younger demographic. It wasn't loud music. It wasn't dark. Uh, and you could sit and have a conversation with somebody and make friends with people. Um, but that was completely a white scene too. So everywhere I went, I couldn't see myself on the scene. And I also found it very odd because um, I was never into ABBA. <laughs> I know that sounds really weird, right? And I was never into ABBA because growing up in Bexley, 
my very good and godly cousin was crazy about ABBA uh, at a time when I was into like more um, kind of soul music and stuff like that. So I was like uh, uh, cool in the gang and that kind of thing. And she was like crazy about ABBA because they were so wonderful and blonde and all the rest of it. Um, she was also crazy about the Osmonds. So the, like, the combination of those two things were like to me, ugh, you know? <laughs> and, and I just turned off. And then I get to this gay scene where you, you have to like ABBA, you're gay, you know? <laughs> and then I also had to own up to not liking Ikea as well. So, so that's like, <laughs> oh, you're, are you sure you're gay? <laughs> Uh, um, but I did meet a, a lady at the attic who once said to me, I've never met one like you. And, and I didn't get what she meant by that. And so I asked her and she basically said, I've never met a person of colour who is gay. And it was like, uh, right, so what am I supposed to do with your problem or your issue, you know, or whatever it is? I mean, it could just be a statement. And then she actually came on to me um, and tried to snog me. And a couple of the gay men stepped in and said, no, no, he's ours, you know. Like. <laughs> so I, I, it was very confusing times because not only could I not find my place, but it seemed to be that the scene had a problem with finding my place too. So it was both ways. The Queen's Army... Queen's Arms in Lewisham was quite different. And I think that was because Josie, who ran it, had this um, Irish background. Um, and I, like, you know, he would always be closed for Good Friday. And he would, um, he would close early uh, on the Thursday. Uh, he was very keen on if somebody died on like having a special occasion or whatever um, and I think it's his own immigrant experiences either his or his families that came through in the way he ran the pub so he saw the pub as a place for minorities and that really came through um, I mean I don't know anything about his sexual life at all because I was never asked or he never told so that's fine um, but it did come across that he was very accepting of people and that's what I found most appealing about the pub but also that it, I enjoyed the lock-ins <laughs> that was always great fun because <laughs> yeah I think what's interesting is like you mentioned that the um, the bars are very seen, sort of like the leather bars. When I first went into the Queen's Arms, I noticed it just felt like just walking into any old pub. You just saw a cross-section, men, women, and there were people of colour in there as well, which you'd expect in Lewisham. Um, and it felt more like, you know, it's just an accepting place where you just yeah. go, have a drink, meet people, yeah. catch up with your mates. And not it wasn't somewhere where you went specifically to go on the pool I didn't think it was more of a and I think against places like the brief encounter or the the leather bars or the other bars in Earl's Court for example which was the center of things at that time um, there were more women as well in Lewisham so you got this sense of this is a normal place this isn't like a sectioned off community it's not a bubble. It's just normal people who happen to be gay or lesbian or trans or whatever they want to be. And actually, nobody actually asked you, like, are you this, that or the other? Nobody boxed you in. And that, I think, was its appeal uh, that you could be. But, the, you know, but that is, is that not an immigrant way of thinking as well? You know, I can be British, but I can also be Bengali or whatever, right? So it's this idea that these boxes don't really exist. We can have multiple identities at the same time. And I think this is why I say that it's Josie's own uh, background that was imprinted on the scene in that pub, and it came through very clearly. Yeah. 
because I sort of remember that Joe was very um, protective, perhaps, yeah. of it, sort of his clientele sort of thing. I mean, I know that some years Christmas he'd like people who he thought were on their own. He would like look up. They're coming upstairs for Christmas dinner, things like. That. So it's almost like he created his own little family there. Do you think? Um, uh, did Josie create a family? Yes, definitely. Uh, I mean, he certainly looked at people like... Can I mention the people? <laughs> Very good question. Um, it will be treated confidentially. Uh, if it's a good story, then you can just use generic, you know... If it's who I think man. it is... Yeah. Can I just use their first names? Or is that... Yeah, we could... Yeah, it'll, if it's anything on our... On, uh, you know, on tape will be treated confidentially, okay. but if we want to use it for podcasts, we need to be more careful about how we yeah. describe people. Okay. Yeah, it's going to take. Are you going to say Sarah? Yes. Because I'm going to interview Sarah anyway. Yes. So, we can so uh, I mean, there were people like Sarah who he really thought of as his own daughter, um, uh, and to a certain extent, even Marcy was like our Marcy, I mean, and he would say that, our Sarah, our Marcy, so which is very, you know, if you've lived in Ireland, that's really the way people talk about family. You'd say our Sean or our Patrick or mm. Porrock or whatever. And it was very much that way of uh, thinking of the community as extended family. Uh, and also taking an interest, uh, if somebody new came to the door and um, a Polish guy came through the door once, and we didn't know at the time he was Polish. Um, and uh, this guy kind of hang around and didn't order a drink straight away. So Josie said, well, Cliff, you know, you've lived all over the world. Go and talk to that guy and find out who he is. You know, <laughs> what's he doing here? <laughs> you know? So I said, OK. Uh, and I started talking to this guy, and he actually ended up being my lodger for three years, and I went out to Poland and stayed with his family. <laughs> um, and so that's the sort of thing that was happening. It, it was never a kind of closed door. Uh, Josie would find somebody to break the ice, somebody to approach the new person through the door. So you never actually felt like, I shouldn't be here. Somebody would always talk to you. Whereas, uh, I mean, I, do you remember going to, is it CXR? Mm. Yeah. And being there for ages and not talking to anybody because it's a kind of pickup scene where if you talk to somebody or you somebody buys you a drink, that automatically means that you have to reciprocate in some way, mm. right? Uh, whereas this was a pub where you could have a whole conversation and you don't actually have to go home with anybody. So, because you know, you could come back two days later um, mm. and meet the same person. And I think that in, in many ways, that was a healthier way to start having relationships. Because the people that you met there were people that you would encounter again. And if it didn't work, it didn't work. And there were plenty of people there that, there were a couple of people there that I could never work out who was going out with whom because I'm sure it was changing <laughs> through time, okay? And I, I remember like one year meeting up somebody and then they were saying, oh, I'm with so-and-so. And then, you know, a year later, oh, we split, so I'm with that person. And I said, well, who's the other person with? And I, oh, I'm with them. And it's like, oh, okay, there's a lot of swapping going on here, but not in a malicious way, not in a, a way that people felt jealous, but in a way that was that felt safe. Mm. You know, it, it wasn't so much about one night stands. It was more about actually having a relationship and a community. Mm. Do you remember, some people don't remember this pub, but the, the John Morden? It's sort of like no. Over the, it's funny because I remember it was over the road from the Queen's Arms, just straight over the road, um, behind what was the leisure centre back in the day with the, you know, the plastic pipes that people used to fly down. Ah. And then there were all those things like, don't go on the plastic pipe, people put razor blades in it. 
Okay, I do remember it because you had to walk up from the high street to get to the Georgian Dragon. You went past it. Um, or you could do, anyway. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because Cinder's was the bar. Yes. My, my manager, oh, bar manager, bar, bar maid. <laughs> I never bar. actually went in there. Um, I'm not sure why. Mm. Um, I don't know. Mm. Yeah. But it's interesting because I sort of identified it as one of the pubs in Lush. I think because I went in there. I mean, it did just vanish. I think one day we went for like a post Pride drink in there. Um, and Cinders was behind the bar, and then the next day we went down, and Cinders was outside. Like everyone's gone; <laughs> it's no longer here. Yeah. The, I think the management has just like disappeared. So maybe it wasn't such an important pub as I sort of pitched it being in my own mind. Um, so I'm thinking, where else would you have gone in the so, area? In the area, so there were two men that ran the Rose and Crown in Greenwich and so that was another pub I would go to I did once go to the castle but I didn't like it uh, and then I remember having a long chat with Josie about the future of the Queen's Arms um, and I said to him the dynamics were changing in terms of who was coming through the door and I said uh, you know, if you want to keep attracting younger people, then you need to offer some sort of dance space. And uh, there isn't the space in the Queen's Arms. Uh, and he thought about it and he said, yeah, I think I agree with you. Uh, and then when the Greenwich University started really gearing up, and uh, particularly the, was it a dance school or something that was? L Larbin. Uh, yes, Larbin? in De Deptford, right? Yeah. Yes. When that started picking up, there was this influx of younger people to the area, but also a very clear LGBT community. And that was about the time that Metro 2 started to be working in the area. So all that kind of coalesced. And then he took it on and opened um, Stonewalls, uh, which has a special space or place for, for me because uh, I went out to dance there one night and that's when I met my partner of 20 years now, this year, mm -hmm. and my husband of 10 years. <laughs> so, so it's a very special place for both of us. Uh, and uh, so my, my husband actually lived in Heather Green, so it's still part of the borough. So I think that changed. That change occurred because the demographic of the gay community in the borough was changing. Where was Stonewalls? Stonewalls was kind of just beyond the um, fire station uh, and across the road. The Catford. Station. Lewisham. Lewisham. Lewisham Fast Station. Yes. Lewisham. Yes. As in Bridget Jones's diary when she tries to come down the fire thing. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, what, well, it was the castle before, wasn't it? Uh, yes. It and was I the did, castle, then it yes, became Stonewalls. Yeah. I did go into it when it was the castle just once, but I didn't really like it. But I did also used to go to the place that Kim was running which was near the, the shop that sold fabrics, which I think is still there in Lewisham. Near Sulky the, Fashions. Yes. And there was a little road beside it, which I don't think is there anymore. And there was a car park or something beyond there. And then there was this little place there, the Roebuck. Mm. And there was a dance place underneath it. But... It was quite a rough and tumble place. Um, and it was very interesting. There were lots of lesbian fights there with, with snooker cues. Was that I think people would say, go there and get hit by a snooker cue, <laughs> you know, and things like that. <laughs> I do remember that. Yes. <laughs> uh, and it wasn't the kind of place I'd go to pick up anybody, I can tell you that much. <laughs> 
I'm sort of remembering upstairs, which they thought was really classy. It was sort of but like, it wasn't. It was sort of like garden furniture <laughs> yes. or something, wasn't it? And then you'd go down. And into this dungeon, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it was like karaoke and women fighting. Horribly sticky floor. Yeah. Yes, your shoes stuck on the floor. OK, we're back in the room. Sorry yeah, about the head of mic, mic issue. We were talking about lesbians brandishing yes. uh, snooker cues in... Where the was robot. it? The Roebuck, which later became The Paradise. Which I didn't... I can't remember it as The Paradise. Well... <laughs> I can't. Uh, uh, I can't see it as a paradise. I, I can't really imagine it ever being a paradise either. <laughs> Yet, so it was rebranded as paradise. I mean, interestingly, uh, when I was talking to Marcy, she was saying, and I thought the same. There's absolutely no. When you walk past where it was, there is nothing to remind you where it was anymore. Because I was looking at, I was like, yeah. where actually was it? Because there's still like the old back of the shopping centre there, yes. and then there's these shops and sake fashions, and but you're like the actual footprint of the road because no. vanished. The road vanished, and so has, in fact, that whole row of buildings has totally vanished. And the only reference point is sake fashions because mm. that was on the corner, uh, so mm. it was literally beside sake fashions. Mm. Uh, which is still there yeah. and has been going for ages. And I, I know when we had um, fancy dress parties amongst the community, uh, that's the place we would go to to buy material to make up. I remember us dressing up as the uh, Brook, Brookback Mountain Boys. Okay. <laughs> it was... I, I'm not sure we carried that off very well, but anyway. <laughs> so we were trying to make these um, cowboy chaps, you know, out of like yeah. something that looked like leather but wasn't. Mm. Uh, and that was the place to go and get all this exotic material, you know. You could be Tarzan or anything, get your fake leopard skin and yep. everything. Glittery stuff, no doubt, for the Duchess... At uh, Georgian Dragon. <laughs> I'm sure his frocks came from there. <laughs> he works about himself. <laughs> he will hear this. <laughs> I, I just remember it mainly from because you know, it, I mean, Pitts and you refer to it as sake fashions, as in, like, oh, you're looking good today. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, just so the robot, I mean, Mars is sort of like, you know, she's been commenting on the, the spaces. Because I think she put a post on of what was the castle in 286 and Stonewalls. Now it's going to be like a sushi place. And I think she took a photo and was like, you know, all these spaces have gone now, you know. And she get, also mentioned how there was, there was no, not even a ghost or trace anymore of the roebuck. It's just been eradicated. And uh, I went with a couple of the artists I'm working with to look at the Queen's Arms. I mean, that you can still tell was a pub. So it's nice that there is still some reference to it there. I mean, the other place I remembered when I had a meeting the other day was the Arizona. Ah, uh, that rings a bell, the Arizona, but I can't, I can't figure it. I don't know where it was. Catford. Or... Ah, OK. Catford Broadway. So I never ventured into Catford. I did try once, and I think I got lost. And there were just so many dodgy people around that that was it. The other thing was Cat, getting from Catford back to Bexley was never easy. You had to go through Lewisham. Mm. But getting from Lewisham to Bexley, so when the night buses were not available, which <laughs> is going back a while, I used to actually walk all the way to Welling from Lewisham. Wow. And then when the N89 started, then I could just catch it and it was like easy to yeah. get home because that was a pretty regular service. Uh, and the buses were practically empty because almost everybody had got off by then. Mm. Uh, so that made a big difference. But um, I do also remember when the police station was put up. In, uh, in Lewisham. In Lewisham. Yeah. Uh, and the bus stop was in front of the police station. And then this peculiar event once where somebody got think shot at the bus stop in front of this police station 
uh, <laughs> which is really bizarre, like of all the places. But mm -hmm. as time went on, I do recall that Lewisham began, like you heard police sirens more often. Uh, and by the time I left the UK, uh, so around about 2002, uh, I kind of stopped going to the bars in, in Lewisham and basically started to go to the Georgian Dragon. Uh, it's an approximate date, I'm not sure of the exact date. So uh, we, we met in Lewisham, but then I think it wasn't long after that that Stonewall shut down or changed its name or whatever. But I think also, um, you know, we were like a couple by then. We weren't so much looking for a kind of teenager or a, a young people's hangout to, to go to. So our, our own needs had changed. And what I, at that point, really enjoyed was always the sort of cabaret nights <laughs> with all the drag queens and the sing songs at the Georgian Dragons which I always loved so uh, it, it's something I really missed later on in life because in Canada they mime they don't actually sing um, and yeah they look good but there's something missing and the banter is very very British and it just doesn't happen there uh, I did once meet um uh, one person on the the drag scene who'd actually I can't remember her name but she had uh, done the South London circuit and she actually had emigrated to Vancouver and um, she tried the banter there and it, it never quite worked the same way people were like too offended people didn't laugh at it um, so, yeah, it's something that's very British that was, you know, very much evident here. I don't know if it still exists in London or whether it's just disappeared. I don't know. I mean, the, what with this project we're looking at, it's not just memories of the spaces, but what happened to them. Not, you know, actually, why did they, when did they close, but, you know, what do you think? perhaps was behind some of the closures? Was it financial, a change in, you touched on change in demographics? Um, do you have any thoughts on what might have led to these places all Well, closing? certainly, I think, um, and maybe it's a global thing, uh, speaking from, uh, so I, I work in Hong Kong, I work at the university, very few of my local Chinese students would declare themselves as being gay, but uh, I don't hide my sexual orientation there, but I don't display it either. So, you know, it's like, is it relevant for me to lecture you and tell you where I am? No, I'm here to lecture you on a subject, and the subject's not me, <laughs> okay? Yeah. So, uh, but a lot of people come out to me, uh, and I get the sense that the role of the pub has changed. And I think it's online apps. Uh, now, I've never used Grindr, so I don't know how it actually works or anything. But uh, I know that most of the gay people that I've encountered in Hong Kong and in London who are like in their 20s spend most of their time on apps of some sort or the other. And that's the way they meet people and ditch people, I have to say, <laughs> so, uh, which uh, to me is, is not the way that I relate to people. And, and, and you know, as, as I've kind of said, what brought me to the Queen's Arms and therefore what brought me into Lewisham from Bexley was the availability of this face-to-face -face encounter. And that way of uh, community relations can only exist with face-to-face -face encounter. What we see on um, social media today is not actually the same thing. Um, and, you know, because if you can zap somebody off just because they've said something that you don't like. So you, essentially you're creating a bubble which leaves out 
uh, people that may have a different view to you, but you're actually blocking the view. So you, your perspective of yourself uh, and of the community around you becomes very boxed in. So this is a completely what I didn't want coming out. And I find that this is now prevalent. And I think that's probably been the biggest demise of gay pubs throughout the world. Mm. I, I totally agree with what you said. In, and it's almost like if you're going online to meet someone, you just meet that person. There isn't any interaction with other people who, you know, if you're having a chat with a couple of people, then somebody else will join in, they overhear you. In a pub, somebody would be like, oh, I went there, or blah, 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 yeah. and you'd start this interaction going. There'd be people like, who you disagree with, and you'd just sort of build up the sort of um, a network, wouldn't you, of people yeah. who you became friends with. And so that builds the sort of communities within the pubs, didn't it? And I, I don't think there is a... A digital equivalent of that no. because there is a certain distance when yes. you use it, an app or yes. whatever. Uh, I, and it, it, I also think at the same time there has also been a movement of people. I mean, speaking for myself, I, I now no longer live in London, but there are people uh, that I know from the metro when I was working with them who would have come to pubs in the borough uh, because they were gay but who now live in Houston. And, you know, so if I, I pass through Houston or they pass through Hong Kong, we meet up. So that, too, is based on an initial face-to-face -face relationship, which is now gone global, but where we use the social media to keep in touch. But it's, the social media has not created new friends for me to have internationally what it does is allows me to keep the friends I've, I made. Um, and I think there is a big difference there. I've met very few people online that I could say are very good friends of mine. Mm. Whereas I've met loads of people face to face who are global that are very good friends of mine. Um, and that's not to say I've been to bed with them or anything like that. Mm -hmm. It's to say that I've met them in the safe space of a gay pub. And I think that's something that we're missing now. Yeah. Can I interject? Mm -hmm. um, just cycling back to the safe space of, I mean, the Queen's Arms, for example. Um, could you walk me through it? Take me through the door, who are you seeing, what's going on, what kind of people are there, what are you hearing, smelling, all of that. Okay, so um, what would normally happen would be that I would finish work, go home to, to Bexley, uh, and then catch the 89 bus, get off uh, at the bottom of, is it Blackheath Hill? Blackheath Hill Road, um, by the bowling alley. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then I would walk around towards the high street and up the road to the Queen's Arms. Uh, I would be aware that there were other pubs and things I would pass, but there were places that I would never actually go into because I would never have a need to go into them. And then there was this climb up the hill. Sometimes um, I would maybe if there was something else happening or somebody else around, I may go to another venue, but most times I'd go straight to the Queen's Arms. And I was always aware that there were these chains on these bollards or something in front, which I do remember somebody falling over and knocking her teeth out on. <laughs> it wasn't me. It was Peter Jones. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> who spent Christmas Day in Greenwich Hospital because I had to take a little Christmas dinner around for yeah. him. And like, here you are, and he was just sitting there looking really miserable, a bit tearful, and then the carol singers came around and he was like, oh, fuck my life, sort of thing. Yeah. The, the lights were positioned on the Queen's head, which was the sign above, rather than on the ground. So if you're coming from outside, it's a dark night, it's winter, you could easily miss those little chains and yeah. trip over them and that actually I know somebody who was coming out and tripped over them and then we had to take her to the hospital um, so 
And that was my, that was supposed to be my night of good luck, but it never really happened. Okay, so it's like hospital care instead. <laughs> Those chains were a menace. They were a menace. Um, and, and if you went there at night, like I usually did, uh, then you'd, you'd come through the door uh, and they would, the doors were usually closed because Josie was quite strict about neighborhood uh, and noise pollution and stuff like that. But it w there were always people, so the bar was in the middle. It never smelt of anything that I can remember, whereas the Roebuck, mm, yes, <laughs> there wasn't a horrible smell there. And I don't know whether it was due to flooding because the lower floor was below street level mm. and are actually on level with the river, the Quaggy. Yeah. So whether there was flooding in there or whatever, but it always smelled musty. Not, not the Queen's Arms. If there's any smell, it would be the beer smell, mm. I would say, because he, 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 yeah, the, he usually used to say, oh, is this, this tap's not working or the barrel's finished or something. And once I remember him showing me how to change the barrel in case he was short of staff. So I actually learned something new. I never knew about things like that before. <laughs> and I learned how to pull a pint as well. <laughs> so that was great. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, you walked in, the bar was in the middle and there were two sides to it. And uh, right on your left hand side, there was like a corner stage, um, which is where people like Rose Garden would perform. But it was impossible to keep people like that on that stage, because firstly, the stage was very small. And secondly, I, I, every drag queen I know has never stuck to a script of any sort and never stuck to a place of any sort. They'd always move around. And that was part of the whole act, to go around and tease people or pick on people. So if you had any sense, you'd like stay far away from that zone. Because, and if you're cute, uh, you'd probably go to the front because you know you'd be made the center of attention somehow or the other. Um, and if you wanted to get noticed, that was the place to be at the front. Um, so. That was basically how it was. I would always find somebody that I knew in there. There was this, this really nice guy that always drank red wine and had these two beautiful dogs. Um, I think they were Afghans. I remember him, yeah. Um, and he used to call them his ladies. And, you know, there were Afghan hounds with these long pointed nose and the hair was always beautiful. And they always stuck their nose up. And they really did look like posh ladies. And he was always there with this glass of red wine and a great person to chat to. I do remember him passing away um, and being told by Josie that he'd passed away, but I don't remember the actual dates. Uh, but there were people like that that were, you know, they were just nice people that you could just sit next to them and have a chat about almost anything. Um, there were people like Mark who was crazy about tennis so and Wimbledon so you could talk about sports which was not a thing you talk about in the brief encounter because that was too macho right <laughs> uh, and there were there were lots of people with a diverse range of interests um, and I I think that's the big part of its appeal um, there was also a guy that used to dress up as the Queen. I think he's still around because I saw so, uh, pictures of him in social media and he really looked the spitting image of the Queen except he swore like hell <laughs> and the more he drank the more he swore but that was that was That's, yes I mean didn't he just like turn up randomly though it wasn't like they'd invited him would you come dress as no, the Queen no he would it, just it turn just up like, Yes. Arrive, wave regally. Yeah. Get drunk. But the only time he did turn out specifically was it was some sort of coronation event or something, some commemorative event. And being the queen's head, we had to have the queen. 
right? And he wore all the stuff and he had the crown and the wig, but it's the profile that he has, which is just the Queen's profile. Um, and it, it, he would start off with some real proper jokes that he'd obviously written and rehearsed, but as he drank and he started to slur and then he would swear and all kinds of stuff like that. And it actually got quite funny watching him do that. Um, I think at one point he had a heart attack or something because he was absent for a year or two. Um, but I think it was the Queen's birthday as well that he used to come because it was June, right, that we celebrate the Queen's birthday. Uh, and if I remember, it was midsummer. And once he came out, and this, in the summer there used to be these two benches at the front of the pub, and he would start talking to anybody walking around in the street. And I remember kids looking at it and saying, Mom, Mom, look, it's the Queen, <laughs> you know? And he would, like, give them this royal wave, you know? <laughs> that was quite funny, actually. <laughs> and by the way, his teeth were not real. They were dentures because oh, they fell out once. <laughs> Which was really funny, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, it was... There was a huge range of people, different ages, uh, people that worked in banks, people that worked in theatre, all kinds of people. Um, and uh, it was always fun. I mean, uh, it, for me, there were two people there that provided the non-white space for me that I was looking for, or the diversity space. Uh, one was Marcy and the other one was Sarah. Uh, and so I kind of felt more comfortable there. But, uh, you know, there were lots of people there that were great fun and that I've kept in touch with. So, yeah. There were even people who used to do some editing for me, like Paul. <laughs> <laughs> proofreading? Yes, proofreading, yes. <laughs> I, I remember it, it was a very small space, wasn't it? Yes. I mean, it's a tiny pub. I mean, and... There was a garden out the back, um, which I, I, I sort of remembered when I saw... An we used to have a barbecue there. Yeah. But one thing I saw, though, on the... Because one, one year, Josie, the person who was supposed to help him with the barbecue, didn't turn up. And so I said, well, I do this every summer for my mum and dad, and I stepped in. Uh, but, yes, the, he used to have this one summer barbecue every year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because I can still remember the garden. and uh, But then there was like, this flyer, it said, like, uh, you know, there's cabaret plus fireworks in the garden. And I was like, there's a health and safety. I mean, fireworks in that room, it's probably like like a window box. Yeah. You know, 20 people standing up, and somebody trying to let off fireworks. I'm like, I think health and safety probably didn't have quite the same import in those days when no. people wanted to have fun, didn't they? No, it? <laughs> no. Uh, uh, it was always fun watching the drag queens take their act out of the building uh, and start to talk to people in the street because you know in those days you still couldn't be yourself totally in public and I'm saying that and even today 20 years later my husband and myself would rarely in fact never hold hands in Bexley Borough because it's a borough that is gay free, if you like, in that it has no gay bars and practically never has had. It's tried a few times, but nothing's actually worked out. And even its HIV services were shifted over to Lewisham Borough, Greenwich Borough. So it's like you just go over Shooter's Hill and you're in a completely different zone where you can't be yourself as a gay person um, and so to see somebody then go out of a gay bar and start this banter with people in the streets is quite um, liberating I guess it's, it very much is I'm here you know I'm gay and I'm here you yeah. know what are you going to do about it yeah. you know yeah. Yeah. yeah I think there was quite a lot of that wasn't there though yes. just like 
randomly the dragons are going into the street. And, and with all of the bars, with, with stone walls, with the castle, as you say, they would go across the street to the firemen um, <laughs> and wave at them and yeah. have a laugh and a joke and talk about how hunky they were or whatever. And, and terminology was different. People didn't use words like buff at the time or whatever, <laughs> you know. Um, uh, Again, even in the robot, people would go out on the street there as well, which is a lot air. more risky <laughs> considering where you were. Uh, but yeah. that was part of, I think, for me, that was the appeal of Lewisham. And, th and that, cr that increased over time because as I started to get into black and Asian history, I went to meet a person called Joan Amin Addo, who wrote the first book on Lewisham's black history. And, and I met her here in Lewisham. So it gave me a sense of like, uh, I may be gay and I have this pub to go to. I may not be white, but my presence here is not something new. So I felt very much that Lewisham was giving me something that Bexley was not able to provide at that time. As time went on, I wrote my own book on Bexley's black and Asian history. Um, and very much looking at how Joan did her book. Sadly, Joan passed away, I think, more than 10 years ago now. But um, uh, I think her daughter may have taken up some of that work in Lewisham. But it's, um, it's kind of interesting how my relationship with the borough became more intense over time rather than less intense, you know, considering that I was actually living out of the borough. Mm. Yeah. You mentioned, sorry, Paul, I no, to no. interrupt. Um, you mentioned, um, both of you actually, before we sort of started the interview on, on tape, um, about how these pubs played a role supporting each other through the HIV crisis. Um, that, that might be something to mm. explore specifically in relation to yeah. you know, the Queen's Arms or whichever pubs? So with regards to the HIV crisis and uh, the pubs in Greenwich and well, the pubs in Lewisham sp in sp specifically, um, I think uh, when I first started to come to the Queen's Arms, people, everybody knew about HIV everybody was still in the AIDS crisis period but uh, and I knew I know that uh, there was generally an acknowledgement that it existed but it wasn't actually talked about much uh, and it was with the arrival really of the walk for life where uh, people from the pub would actually do the walk and then meet at the pub afterwards. And that, that wasn't just... Um, I, I think it started with the Queen's Arms, but later on it included very much the Georgian Dragon too, because they used to have their own like walking team. What was the Walk for Life? The Walk for Life was uh, an, a way of a sponsored walk to get money for uh, HIV and AIDS in London. It was mainly headed by T Terence Higgins Trust, if I remember correctly. Um, but it was a government thing. The walk itself didn't take place in any of the outer London boroughs. It took place in central London, usually. It uh, later became a walk that started off near City Hall and finished there, so it would like do this round trip through the city and come back to City Hall. Uh, but it was something that I did for quite some time after a friend of mine um, in Kenya um, contracted HIV, locked himself in his room and died, not of HIV, but of starvation. And I realized at that time that, you know, as I said before, Nelson Mandela call this a poverty called the whole HIV situation uh, as a result of poverty and 
in that case it really was because it was a poverty of understanding from his own community that led him to lock himself away. It was a, a poverty of his bosses not accepting him as an, a person with HIV and AIDS in the end uh, that led to him losing his job. The medications were available, but they were so expensive in Africa that people couldn't afford them. So it made me realize that this is very real. This is somebody that I worked in tourism at the time in, in London, and um, he was my contact agent in Nairobi. So for something to happen to a person who I've met, who I've hung out with, I've had a drink with, uh, even though he'd never come out to me, uh, but I knew, um, and then for him to die in such a tragic way, which didn't have to be, you know, there was everything around in the world for this person to live. And so I, I then started to do the Walk for Life every year. And that was really, this was before Metro came on the scene in South East London. And this was really the way the community started to be more orientated towards the needs of the HIV positive community, both in the UK and beyond. At around, I think it was about maybe, well, it had to be in the late mid 90s, the Harbour Trust was set up in Woolwich. Lewisham and Greenwich uh, I think Greenwich and Bexley were a joint healthcare initially, but then Lewisham was part of that. Um, and that was the hub for people with HIV. Uh, and it was run initially by gay men. Uh, sadly, I know that at least two of those have passed away. Um, I became involved with them in around about 1998-99 and then later became director there and so I then started reaching out to the pubs now there was one pub in Woolwich too Woolwich uh, Infant? Mm, no it was it was bang in the centre of town uh, yeah I can't remember exactly um I think it's where one of, where the station near the station somewhere. I, I know where you mean. I can't think. Yeah, I can't called. think the name. Sort of heading towards Plumstead. Yes, way. yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, uh, anyway, so I started reaching out to the pubs to support the Harbour Trust because, as a trust, uh, we needed to. We we did have a core amount of money provided by the boroughs but we needed extra money because the number of people that were coming in were increasing by almost 150% per year at one point. Um, and at the same time, the demographics of the people started to change from gay people to uh, gay and straight black communities, primarily African from Uganda and from Zimbabwe. So. By that point, Metro was started to work with the young people that had come into Lewisham Borough as a result of Greenwich University, etc., etc. Uh, and I realized that there was this disconnect between Metro as a provider of support for LGBTQ people uh, and particularly for young people facing difficulties with coming out uh, against the fact that it had no coverage whatsoever for people infected with HIV. And so um, I waited for a while and then a new director came, a guy called Craig, came over from Australia and uh, Greg was really, I think I met him in the first week he arrived. Um, and there was a pub very near here. Um, Goldsmith's Tavern? It was up on the road that goes like up the hill from 
uh, from New Cross Station. The Rosemary's Arms. The Rosemary Branch. The Rosemary Branch, yeah. that's it. Um, and that was that had been run by two friends of mine uh, for a very short time. I think they had real difficulties with the rents there. Uh, and they tried to make it work anyway. And so I, I, Greg arrived from Australia, took up this new position, and I arranged to meet him there um, and just give him a map of the pubs in South East London for, from the point of view of Metro's outreach, but also uh, as a way of providing funding by events for Metro. Um, and at that point, I raised the issue about this disconnect between the HIV positive community and who are also LGBTQ, but also uh, against the community that saw itself as LGBTQ, but were non-HIV. So, you know, and I said, well, this is just ridiculous. This shouldn't be happening. And he, he actually didn't know that this issue existed because he just stepped into the position until he started looking at the paperwork. And then he realized that the initial paperwork did not cover HIV. Uh, we don't know exactly why, but he did put it to the board to try and change that. And some of the board actually resigned over it. So he found himself in this difficult position where he wanted to make change and he needed a full quorum to to do this. So he said, would I mind stepping down from my director's position at the Harbour Trust and joining the board at Metro to enable this transformation to occur? And, and I did, and consequently, Metro changed things. But it worked good for the Harbour Trust too, because as a result, the Harbour Trust then, um, as years went by, needed a larger uh, canopy, if you like, to work under, uh, an organisation that had the capacity to apply for grants, etc. Because we only had two actual workers at the Harbour Trust, um, social workers. The rest of us were all volunteers. And from Greenwich and Lewisham, uh, and Bexley boroughs primarily, so these three boroughs. Um, so what ha actually then happened was Metro um, accepted to include the Harbour Trust as a organization under its own umbrella. Uh, and that's enabled it to really blossom and get more funds. They were able to open outreach stations and even though the people that originally worked in Bexley are now based in Vauxhall or with, with Metro, they still had an outreach um, in Greenwich Town which covers Lewisham. It also meant that the outreach from Metro with the pubs now provided money for local services for HIV people in these three boroughs. Sorry, you mean the pubs were fundraising? Or? Yeah, so Metro was fundraising in the pubs. Uh, and uh, so you had this situation where people like Josie would be approached and asked, uh, could we have a fundraising event? Sometimes he would set it up himself. Um, but there would be people like Pit Stop, which were, would hand out condoms and provide uh, information about sexual health um, across board but also directions so they were signposting people to different other organizations uh, either in the borough or beyond it um, and basically the publicans uh, you know Paul uh, at the Georgian Dragon uh, all of these people I think he, Kim also had one event um, at the Roebuck too. Maybe it had changed its name to Paradise then, I don't know. <laughs> um, but people were having these events uh, and raising a lot of money. I mean, at times over 500 
pounds a night would be raised, which would go straight to the Harbour Trust uh, or to the Metro funds, which would eventually go to the Harbour Trust anyway. So it was a great way of the community accepting that it had a responsibility for its own. Uh, and with that, we did start to see a more diverse gay group coming to these um, pubs as well. Because it, you know, um, I mean, I'm not going to name any names, but there are so many people that I know from the pubs who were HIV positive, uh, but who would never have said anything in the pub. But the money c coming from these events made them feel that they were not being stigmatized or they were not kept outside. And they could see genuinely that the pubs and the clientele were supported, putting their money where their mouth is, you know, and not just saying, oh, you know, I'm up for this or whatever, but literally raising money. Uh, and the acts were very, very important for that. All of the acts um, were wonderful people, you know, um, it's such a range of people as well, different ages, uh, you know, all kinds of weird names. Uh, was that something Hyde? Tanya Hyde. Tanya Hyde. And still do the yes. Georgia Dragon. Yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, I mean, all, all kinds of people. Uh, and then there was a, um, a black act as well. He lives somewhere across the river in Limehouse or somewhere. Um, he used to, like, do, like, Shirley Bassey and stuff like that. I can't remember his name now. I remember the, there was a black woman who sang in the um, Queen's Arms quite a lot because Joe would always like make everyone shh. She used to do, do the Sade always, songs. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Shade, and I'll always love you for an encore. And Joe yeah. would go, shh. Don't, don't talk. Don't talk in. <laughs> you know, it's like, you mustn't speak. Yes, She's, dead silence. Yeah, I can't remember her name off the top of my head, but... And the last thing she ever wanted was a load of gay men singing at high pitch notes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. drowning around, yeah, yeah. yes. <laughs> More dramatic. All being dramatic Madonnas yeah. or yeah, something, sure. yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one thing we spoke earlier about, and can we just go back to it, is Mandy and your time in the Georgia Dragon when you would be... And mind you, would sign posts. Maybe. Yeah, I think um, publicans are very important on, on the gay scene because um, very often uh, gay people don't have somebody that they can talk to when things get really rough. Uh, and they try to drown them, their sorrows. Some people do it with drugs, which only makes things worse. Um, but most people in that period of time would go to a pub and they would try and drink themselves to forget their troubles. That's usually the point where the person behind the bar, like Mandy, would spot that there's an issue. Um, and, you know, she's basically doing a counsellor's job but doesn't know she's doing it. And she she would like chat with them, find out what the problem was. And knowing that I was working with Metro, uh, so I, I went on to work um, both with the Harbour Trust, but also with Metro uh, on various projects of theirs and running in a drop-in centre for positive men for almost 10 years. Um, so she would kind of say, you know, Cliff, this person, blah, blah, blah. Or she would tell the person, go and talk to Cliff. And I would just give him my card and say, ring me tomorrow or wherever, we have a drop in, come and talk to us um, because I'm not going to talk to you while you've been drinking and this isn't the place to be talking about this either. And we would that would be like closed. And she would never let on to anybody. So, you know, people really trusted her. Um, uh, so it's been great to see that she's taken that out of the bar and actually got her qualifications to act in that position, you know, professionally. Uh, it's wonderful to watch her career, really. So um, Mandy was on she the was bar at George the Georgian Dragon. Dragon, yes. And now she, she, I think she currently works for the within the National Health. Uh, I know she was doing that, but I haven't checked her out like recently. Yeah, That's fine. yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. It's your friend on. 
Facebook, Twitter, or she is on Facebook. I'll yeah, try and, uh, yeah. I always used to really like Mandu. I think she was very popular. She's very she popular. She was a character on the scene, wasn't she? Yes, yes. Just like strong Northern Ireland accent. Very strong <laughs> Ulster accent. Yeah. Yes. Um, and but I haven't seen her. I think she was. I should say Ulster accent. Yes. It seems you'd say that Mandy people would do sort of like the Irish accent, yes, wouldn't yes. they? And like, oh, that Mandy. <laughs> that Mandy. <laughs> yeah. yes. um, I mean, I haven't seen it for a few years, but I'd really like to track yeah. it down for this because I think it's another really and good a, And a story. different perspective. Mm, from know, behind the bar. From behind the bar, yeah. yeah. Almost yeah. sounds like a, a logo in itself, <laughs> doesn't it? Yeah, from like the bar. From bar. Yes. <laughs> oh, I, I dread to think what some of those bar people saw. Or heard. Uh, or heard, yeah. Yes. I, mean, I mean, I remember some fantastic times. It just really made me laugh when in the Queen's Arms, when I think somebody, as Marcy said, you know, she was like, I was barred every other week, you know. And, uh, yeah, so Josie's thing, whereas Mandy was like, I'll start with this and that. Uh, Joseph's thing was you're barred you know and he would like do this and it was every week it was the same person <laughs> right I mean Kim was one wasn't she that I think maybe got barred once or twice or something and um, I mean Beverly never uh, but that's another thing you know there were there were people that came in like Beverly and Alison who had their sons there and these little kids would be around us, and we were part of their family. And you know, as years went by, they would grow up, and they would get married, and they would have their own kids, and we're still in touch with them. Uh, and in a funny sort of way, I still think of them as family because I still remember them as little kids wandering around. But there was never this thing of, oh, they're lesbians, or they're the lesbians' kids, or whatever. No, they were just kids, and they were part of us and that was it you know um, and it you know even now that we're all over the world uh, and we're online we're still very supportive I mean if you look at the people that Marcy chats to whenever she's having a downtime it's people everywhere that are there for her and keep her going and 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 vice versa because I do think she's quite a um, an icon for people who are facing difficulties of whatever sort. Uh, and, you know, those people that used to go to the Queen's Arms are now getting to their 50s and 60s and maybe even later. And so, you know, we've all got issues, that health issues that come up. So it's people like Marcy that become uh, a way of seeing a positive force in our lives and helps us to deal with whatever comes up. Um, but yeah, that support network, it may be in a different, different medium now, but it's still there. And it stemmed from, from the, pub. the day, yeah. yeah, when we all met each other yeah. and built those relationships. Yeah. 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 Can I just follow that up, really? Um, yeah, sure. So this project is called Where To? Now the sequence have gone. I mean, you're connected with people that you met back in the day and you can keep in touch with them on Facebook or whatever, but where would you go? I mean, I know you don't live in London, but if you were visiting London, where would you go to meet other gay people or your sort of community? Where would I go to meet people now in the gay community? Um, to be honest, I don't actually know because I was last in London in October and I went to the Rose and Crown and there were a couple of people that I knew from back in the day, uh, but the place didn't feel particularly gay. Now, Cinders had a place across the road from there, on that corner of Greenwich Park. There was a, a pub there. The and she, yes, and she ran that for a while. And then, of course, she moved to Compton Street. The Admiral Duncan. The Admiral Duncan, and that terrible affair when it was bombed uh, and I think she was injured yeah. at the time because she, yeah. but somebody died if I remember correctly yeah. Yeah. Uh, so as a community you know we started off in Lewisham but as we've gone out we've also all had 
uh, to face different issues uh, of the wider world, um, whether it's beyond Lewisham into other parts of London or other parts of the world. Uh, and so, I, I sadly, I have to say, I don't know where I would go now in London. And certainly on this visit, I haven't been to any gay bar in London. That's also because of COVID as well. So there's, there's two things at work here, which has also closed a lot of bars in Hong Kong that couldn't possibly continue when uh, expats left, uh, and that was due to harder COVID restrictions. So it was the expats that were keeping these bars running, uh, and they had to shut down. So I, the the whole scene has, uh, maybe would have gone online anywhere, but COVID has forced it to do it quicker and sooner. Mm. Uh, and I think that that's really sad. I mean, I honestly don't know any gay bars in London now. So I wouldn't know where to go. Mm. Which is kind of sad. Yeah, I mean, if you, I mean, I don't go to the bars in Soho or anything because it's not for me. You know what I mean? Yeah. You feel like they're very much a young person's. Possibly the only bar that I am aware of off, but I haven't been to for a while is Compton's because particularly in the afternoon or, or early evening you do meet people that formerly were out in the bars in Lewisham but now work at jobs in central London and so they go for a quick drink there before coming back um, because there's nowhere to go in Lewisham now so um, so so the bar scenes retreated to Compton Street, essentially, and, and the surrounding mm. areas of Soho. Uh, and it's dead in, in um, Earl's Court. It's no longer a, a gay area, really, uh, like it was. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of where things are at the moment. I, I don't want to go to those bars because uh, I have to protect my mum. So... Uh, I don't take undergrounds. Not that I, I could walk from Charing Cross there, but yeah. For shielding for coronavirus. Shielding, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the sort of theories is that one of the reasons that there are fewer gay bars is because we've all got rights. The world is so accepting, we can all hang out in the Fox and Firkin or something. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, do you see those venues as places that you, you can go with your partner, with your gay friends? That's an interesting question. What sort of venues would I go to um, in terms of the ordinary pub? Um, now, I, I was talking to somebody about this just yesterday. Uh, she's from Zimbabwe and she, she's my master's um, colleague from when we did our master's together. Uh, and we were in Welling and I was trying to explain to her in the safe surroundings of an African restaurant, that there are there are several bars in Welling that I would never go into because they were so racist, and those bars are still racist, and you know that when you walk past them, you know the looks you're getting, you know the little snide remarks that you can see being made, so you're really aware of it. Most, I would say. I would say 50% of the bars anywhere have shut down and turned into supermarkets and things. But even those that surround, uh, that survive, there are still very racist bars. So I would never have gone into those bars anyway. Uh, and I very rarely went into bars in Bexley because of that. So my bar world no longer exists in the suburbs. It only exists in the center of London. Uh, where I would go, I feel I can go in and sit down with my husband and have a drink or meet up with people. Um, but I don't feel comfortable doing that in the suburbs. And it's, I mean, it's complicated interaction, right? But it's as much to do with race as to do with sexuality. Yes, we, we are a biracial couple a biracial gay couple. And we have had 
are issues in that. I mean, uh, we had a lot of issues in Canada with getting my work, um, my, my permit of residency, which is why we left Canada and went to Hong Kong. And then when we arrived in, Ca in Hong Kong, I could only get a permit to stay there if I had a job there. And at approaching 60, that was not going to be easy. So I initially got um, a permit by working with the university for no money. So like as, uh, uh, I guess, uh, an assistant role, very much needed in the university, but no funding. Then I got fed up with that because I got pulled up with immigration because they, um, they didn't process my visas. And I thought, well, I don't really want to have a black mark in immigration in China, right? <laughs> so um, my husband uh, works for a, a, a Canadian company, which is very pro-diversity and equal rights. And there were two cases in Hong Kong involving uh, foreigners who were married to locals. One was a lesbian couple, one was a gay couple. And Hong Kong still has the British system where if it's passed by the courts, then it becomes law. And they won the case. So Hong Kong started to recognize overseas marriage and therefore issue, because it doesn't say in law who you marry. It just says if you're married overseas, you're married in Hong Kong. And so I now have a spousal visa attached to my husband's in Hong Kong, which means that it doesn't matter whether I'm working or not working, uh, I have a visa and I can stay. Before, I had to get out of the territory every six months. So I'd go to Macau, get a new stamp of my passport and come back. During COVID, of course, we can't even travel to Macau. So this changed. So we were amongst the first 100 gay couples in Hong Kong to get spousal visas. Uh, and we're pushing the doors with other organizations, uh, clubs and things. We're kind of saying, look, you know, this is the law in Hong Kong. Therefore, if, you, if I have membership on whatever terms, my husband has to have the same. And we've actually done that with a few clubs and they were like oh and then they said okay that's the law right so you know it's funny to think but it's it's the support of places like Lewisham that give me the energy and the determination to push for this international changes really and I, I know I'm not the only one I know there are other people from the borough who've also faced issues um, in other parts of the world and have also pushed boundaries. I know somebody else who lived in Lewisham bound, uh, Borough who went to, um, to the States, um, uh, to Texas, and they're a biracial gay couple too, and they've also been pushing boundaries there. So, um, you know, it, it's funny to think about a place like Lewisham having such a huge influence. But, you know, like I said, Joan's book in, on the black and Asian history of Lewisham Borough was like set the scene for other boroughs. Um, and as a result, um, English Heritage produced a book uh, on the Grand Estates, which included ones in Bexley that was written by me. But it's built on stuff that was from Lewisham. Um, and it's sort of set the scene for the widest, why the world or the wider Britain, you know. And that sort of tone has been set at the local authority level, or would you think just oh, generally? Oh, further. I mean, English heritage. But I mean, yeah. it's starting in Lewisham, it's, it's, it's the community it's, or it's the I local council? I think it's community, so it's very roots based. It's the communities of Lewisham, which as far as I can remember, was always a multi-ethnic, diverse place, at least as far as I know. So when I first arrived in England, it's way back in 71, and we moved to Bexley, we actually did our shopping here in Lewisham because the old shopping centre was the only real place in this whole area to actually get 
the things we wanted. And the Ocean Market had the the foods that we couldn't get, <laughs> plantains and stuff like that. So this was the place to come uh, as immigrants to get whatever we wanted. Uh, and definitely the main shopping area for this whole area. Even Woolwich did not compare in those days. Um, and, and, you know, Bexley, I mean, still is a 95% white borough, but it was even more so when we arrived. Um, and so, like, I know my mum had trouble getting jobs and things, uh, but it, it Lucian provided that function and that support just by being Lucian, you know? Yeah. And, you, I mean, you're commenting here really in relation to sort of issues of racial diversity and inclusion um, rather than from spearheading an acceptance of gay people or do you see them as sort of overlapping? I think the acceptance of ethnic diversity came before the acceptance of sexual diversity and I think that's as I you know touched upon earlier that's a thing about you can you can hide your sexual identity after all in most cases not all sex happens behind closed doors um, and so there was, you know, I can't hide the way I look. Uh, and I'm reminded about that when I come, I recently came through Gatwick. So my husband goes through the gates, the auto gates, but my passport won't let me go through the auto gates because the facial ID does not work well with darker skin. And, and I, I posted it on Twitter as an issue uh, and so many other people said the same thing. So on entering the UK with a British passport, I'm still segregated by this system. Uh, so if you kind of think about that level of not acknowledging diversity that's still there, then like it's not saying you're gay, that's why you can't come in. It's saying you you look different. That's why you can't come in, right? So you have to like show your passport, answer questions to get in to the country that's supposed to be yours. <laughs> so, it, you know, it works in stages. I think. Um, I think even I would say that the racial point is one point, but perhaps uh, sexual equality too is another point. Um, women's rights, uh, which we are very much involved in because my husband works in textiles and 80% of his company's workforce are women. Um, and so, you know, we've put a lot of money into schools specifically for girls in Kenya uh, and helped set that up. Um, another friend of mine, actually a school friend from Bexley, has set up HIV schools in, in Uganda. Um, so. This area and this community has actually had tentacles elsewhere, but I believe that it's the grassroots support in this area that's given individuals the strength and the capacity emotionally to be able to do these things. Hmm. Hmm. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think that's true, because doing this project, I mean, it's brought up a lot of things about the cultural, the sort of Lewisham's culture aspects, and also I've come across sort of like how gay sweatshops all set up and did a lot of work in the Albany and so on, and it's really radical, the work they did, and but it was supported locally, people went to it, they'd go to out dance at the Albany, but they'd also go and see... A performance by a gay sweatshop or something and then go to the pub to chat about it afterwards and and again I think there was that quite a radical undercurrent in a lot of what's gone on in this area also the anti-fascism movement absolutely which was so strong in uh, and the current movement I, I know there was this weekend there was some sort of demo or march uh, about the 
changing laws uh, in the UK and you know things like the Rwanda issue and stuff like that. So all of these things, uh, you don't hear anything from Bexley because it's a conservative borough. Uh, and you hear slightly less from Greenwich. I think in many senses, it, it's Greenwich has more money it does have areas that are very deprived, but it also has very, very rich areas. Uh, whereas things are a little bit more equal in, in Lewisham, but there's always been this, you know, it was like at one point, uh, I, I would say I would identify the announcements at Lewisham Station as being as coming from somebody from the Caribbean. Then at another time they were from somebody from East Europe. Then at another time they were African. And you can hear all these accents at Lewisham Station, and it's like, right, I'm arriving at a very different place. Whereas Bexley Heat Station still sounds as it did in 1971. Okay. <laughs> you <know? laughs> You're enlightening. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> that's a, a fantastic point. Yeah, when you sort of like listen to announcements in Lewisham, the what's all this like the Caribbean sort of accents or a very camp accent yeah. for that matter, yeah. you know, which which I, you know, New Cross Station. I remember uh, arriving there, and the guy that was on the train. It was the underground train that goes to East London. Uh, it's the East London Line, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so he was a friend of mine, and. He, Rob and he is from Lucian and he was the train driver and he spotted me getting the train so he made an announcement on the train uh, to say and for Cliff coming on the train you know and this sort of thing you know and it, you know where where else does that happen you know, you, you know? <laughs> Did he work on DLR for a while Yes yeah I know him yeah Yeah <laughs> yes he's now become a monk No Yes. Oh, <laughs> <that> surprising. <laughs> it's too oh. handsome to be a monk. Uh, <laughs> yes. I, I, I mean, I didn't know him that He's well, joined so. the Franciscans. Oh, yeah. right. Yeah. Wow. It's been on a, a very interesting journey, but I'm very happy for him because he's happy. Yeah. It's where he wants to be. Uh, and, yeah, it's, yeah, so we're still in touch, okay. you know, online. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, mean, I didn't know him that well, so yeah. I didn't know, you know, he got this... Yeah. spiritual yeah. side. I mean, yeah. there have been sad occasions. Uh, one of my friends from the borough, uh, who actually lived um, one of the blocks just up here, uh, passed away and was dead for a week before they found him. And the only reason that they found him was because I hadn't heard from... I knew he was going home to see family in the northeast which was a little bit of a toxic environment which is why he was in London so we're still seeing London and Lewisham as a place of refuge you see and I hadn't heard from him after Christmas and I thought this isn't right uh, and he kept, he'd come out and seen us in Vancouver and you know uh, and I thought something's not not good here so I asked another gay person, also in New Cross, to check on him, and they said they couldn't get in touch with him. And then I asked Rob to go to the, the flat, uh, and people hadn't seen him, and they hadn't seen his cat. Now that's worrying, because if he's gone away, he would have, he loved his cat, he would have given his cat to somebody. So the police came and knocked down the door and he literally died watching TV. The TV was still on. And he seemed to have had some massive heart attack or something. And it was quite devastating for all of us. I think more so because it's not the death, because, you know, working with HIV and AIDS, death was quite prevalent at one point. Uh, and there's enough people I've sat with or sat with family members and watched somebody pass away. But it was the fact that he died alone and it, it was a whole week before anybody knew it. And there's me in Hong Kong trying to get it actioned here. You know, um, so I think that really hit all of 
us very badly because it was like you know we 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 out to be in touch with each other more there's the technologies there to allow us to do that uh so that none of us find ourselves in this situation when was this this was uh so we uh so i was in hong kong so it would have been six years ago right yeah and i mean you must have thought well who's looking out for him on the ground because it was you doing you know raising the, the alert from hong kong yeah yeah uh and yeah i mean rob took it very badly uh because they were really good friends uh and rob actually found a home for the cat because the he had cat food and stuff and the cat was okay but um you know yeah so you know so there've been some sad times and i think that is an indication of the demise of the pubs because this person would have been going to a pub and people would have seen him and then suddenly he wasn't there and if there'd been more pubs and you know it was i think this wouldn't have been quite so bad i'm i'm not you can't guarantee death it's Yeah. you're born to die i say yeah. it's the one thing you're guaranteed when you're born is that you'll die oh, but <laughs> it's the land del rey over yeah. there <laughs> it's true though right yeah, yeah. absolutely <laughs> so um you don't know when it's going to happen but you hope it's not going to be you on your own yeah. and you hope that people will find you if you yeah. do die on your own right but you know a week is a long time uh and you know It's kind of yeah. sad. But I think back in the day, if a regular in the Queens did didn't turn count. up, you'd be like, "Oh, have you seen so?" Some yeah. would say, like, "Oh, they're on holiday," or "Oh, they're yeah. you know they're dead this yeah. or that." It, And people used to know. take holidays together. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So I took a holiday in Gran Canaria, and I was sitting in a bar, hoping to pick up, and along comes Rose Garden, recognizes me, and says. What's your horror doing round here? <laughs> you know, I was like so embarrassed, you know. <laughs> With a broad, loud Northern Irish accent, you know, lots of f's thrown in because you can't do a Northern Irish accent without that, okay? <laughs> And I didn't pick up. Obviously, I mean, I had bad press there. Yeah. So, right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But I I do know that a lot of the drag queens used to do this. Is it August at some point where they used to all go to Gran Canaria and oh, they used to do <laughs> yes they used God, to do this big just... drag thing there and there was a particular pub that they used mm. to go to. Um, so you know even in in those days this was there was an extension from Lewisham to the Gran Canaria. <laughs> you know yeah. I, and so that I noticed is. Revived this year, which is good, is the track race. Yes, because that's another fundraiser for the metro. For the metro, it, yes, it has been in the past. Yes. and I didn't realize it was back, but it's back this year. Yes, it is. Sounds like good. And that's uh, from again from Greenwich Town, right? Yeah, it's yes. starting outside the Rose yeah. and Crown again. Yeah, which, uh, and interestingly, because you said about the Rose and Crown, and uh, I mean, over the last 20 years, it's switched from being a gay bar to a straight bar to a gay bar to a straight bar. They like went straight during the Olympics. I'm seeing they'd get more visitors, and then I think they found it hard to get the gay gay crowd back in because I think they almost lost trust with people. Uh, well, the management's changed several times. Mm -hmm. It was also a bar that was trans. Um, accepting because uh, one of the bar people there was part of the trans community uh, for a while uh, and you know worked in the print shop I don't know oh, where, right, I think. where she worked yeah, I think I know but you. I you know the fact that the bar did that had a bar person from the trans community actually says a lot because this is the person that's out there in front of everybody rather than coin in the corner or something um and would actually stand up for her if she had flack from anybody uh i thought that was brilliant 
uh, and you know it's great to see it in this area because it's a continuation of the same pushing boundaries that for me anyway is what Lewisham represents um, I, I think also uh, within this area is also I know the bar is actually technically in Greenwich mm. right um, but I kind of boundaries were artificial anyway yeah. um, but the I think even like Greenwich Museum could do more it kind of compare it with the Museum of London that's, that employs people with disabilities on their front desk uh, I think again it's a statement but it's also accepting that look the person's doing the job this isn't tokenistic mm -hmm. you know uh, so yeah I'm all for that you know yeah yeah definitely well I think do you have any? Uh, I've exhausted my questioning. I can't think of anything else, Rosie. Yeah, I've got any. No, I mean, come I, think, I think uh, well, lots came out. <laughs> <laughs> was there anything yeah. that you um, wanted well, I know to was talk about? Something about. actually um, was the two of you, right? Um, tell me how you got to know each other. Back, scrolling back, I think it was to the Queen's Arms. Mm -hmm. Well, you had two friends and Chrissy with the ball. <laughs> it's like, I've never. Oh, I've I've never I know. Yes, yeah, cause I never know her full name, but I just call Chris, it Christy. Yeah, Chrissy Chris, with the ball, because yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. she had this this pendant, this ball pendant. Yeah, because yeah, <laughs> yeah, people used to play with it, and they used to like. People, yes. So then he knocked one of her te front teeth out. <laughs> 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 he he, he <laughs> bounced up and hit, hit her teeth. Yeah. <laughs> because I think she's in competition with Marcy for who got barred the most by Joe. Because Joe, she got very rowdy when she yeah, was drunk. Yeah, rowdy. She yeah. vomited on the floor once. And Joe was <laughs> like, oh, no way. God, yeah. And again, this is a person that I, I couldn't care whether she was bi, gay, or whatever. She was just Chrissy with the ball, right? And there was like. I think that was very much the pub's way, though. We never really yeah. labelled anybody. It was very, like, fluid yeah. uh, in a way. Uh, even with Marcy, I never, I never asked her, and I don't care. No. It's just Marcy, right? Yeah. Um, uh, so it, it was the same. So she was with you and... Jonathan. Jonathan, yeah. that's it. Yeah. Yes. So I did meet Jonathan uh, just once after I left London mm. I came back once and I met him and I almost didn't recognize him but he'd done a lot of manscaping like he just transformed himself and I was like is that you yeah. <laughs> you know yes yeah, and he, he pumped himself up and yeah. he, he had this like which he never had before <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> he completely changed you know um, but yeah, it was like you three were always together because you shared the we house. We all lived up at Heather Green Lane. Yes. Yeah, so we just, just trudged yes. on down to the pub together. So that's how I got to mm. meet them. And then I asked you to um, edit my notes on Zhang He. Mm. Now, I first went to Hong Kong in 1986 to research Zhang He, as you know from the notes. Yeah. And I now lecture on Zhang He. Uh at the same university that I researched at. Wow. <laughs> so it's gone a full circle. Definitely, yeah. 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 So. That's, yeah, that was, yeah, just doing the proofreading thing and stuff. So and that, was, just, that was really the start of the, I would say, the profession that I currently work on or in. So, again, it was down to the contacts in the bar. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there are other people with similar stories, you know, that, that went there. Mm -hmm. So how was it down to the... I mean, obviously, Paul did a fantastic piece of proof of editing <laughs> yeah. for you. Yes. <laughs> but but, but he, reading his proof reading and reading the finished article made me realise that I'd actually done something important that nobody had done before the famous Gavin Menzies came out with his book. And I'd actually done that a whole decade or two before that um, and that you know I've ended up working on a cruise line between Muscat and Singapore lecturing on that on board and on shore uh, all kinds of exotic places in the Indian Ocean uh, so 
you know, it, it's opened doors for me and it's actually established me as the specialist on this 15th century Chinese admiral who sailed to East Africa. And I'm the expert on him and East Africa. Well, <laughs> yeah. Okay, well we won't digress, but, no, but, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I guess other things, you talked about the lock-ins, that's what you liked yeah. about the Queen's arms. Yes. What was going on in these lock-ins? Lots of drinking. Oh. Yeah, there was, there was actually never sex in the pub, which uh, I think a lot of people thought that because we would say lock-in and they would think, oh, what's going oh, on yeah. in there? But Josie would never allow that. So yeah. it wasn't that sort of pub, and there wasn't there wasn't a dark room or anything like that. So it was all above board, mm -hmm. but we would get very very drunk. And if there was a drag queen, then the show would go on. At which point, Little Legs and myself would get onto these two tables beside the stage and do this kind of formation dancing, with, with. <laughs> so we were both little guys. And they would be like, get your shirt off, get your shirt off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So get off yeah. <laughs> uh, but that was Marcy, so <laughs> yeah. And there's um, Josie also, this is quite funny actually, but I, I think it's, I wouldn't normally talk about it, but I think it's quite funny. So one day we were playing bingo with somebody. No, we were doing the quiz. Mm -hmm. We had a quiz night. Yeah. Yeah. Was it Friday night or something? I can't remember, well, once a week a, there yeah, was a definitely. quiz night, mm. and um, I had I was in charge of I think because we had groups, didn't we? Yeah. Uh, and teams, and somebody put down some name for the team. So when I write my name Cliff, um, when I'm being arty and farty with, about it, I kind of do this c like this an l straight down so the c is like an arrow head and l is just a line a, a vertical line and then an i which is another vertical line little dot and then the f is two vertical lines coming down further and then i just put a line across it so josie read it out as kitty <laughs> and it stuck and he'd, he'd shout out, Clitty! <laughs> and and I, I just got used to it in the end and just yeah. responded to it. And then at another time, I, I can't remember who it was, but there were two guys that I'm not sure if they were together or not, but they were always drinking together. And one of them, um, uh, and this is not so nice, thought that being the only Asian in the pub, he called me Gita from, is it Coronation Street or? I think it was. One of those soaps. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and again, Josie would say, Gita! <laughs> right. <laughs> but then, then he would go back to, Clitty! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and people just took this for granted. Like, mm. there was no, you know, it wasn't, but new people coming in would be like, what? Your mm. name's Clitty, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm Clitty, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it really did sort of like a uh, rule at the pub, didn't it? Yeah. Like, you know, I remember one time somebody had been barred, um, went in and Joe was like, can I have a word in the garden, please? And we were just standing by the door and the garden door was open. So we did like, meh, 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 meh. Then we heard like a, like, oh! Then they came back in. He's like, slap me face, but I'm allowed back in again. <laughs> Joe? Yes, the yeah. landlord slapped his face and like, there, don't do it again, but you're, you can come back. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, you know, it's like, I mean, people would probably say that's wrong, <laughs> but I, I, it just sort of fits into that whole quite high camp pub yeah, going yeah. where you get your face slapped and yeah. back in the pub again. <laughs> what do you think they were doing that uh, justified the... Uh... I don't know, I don't know. Uh, it... I mean, it could be that somebody was being a bit too amorous in the in the pub, so it was, you know, mm. like this isn't that sort of pub. What were the grounds? Yeah, what were the grounds for being barred? What would he bar oh, you for? Oh God, well, anything. Yeah, yeah. anything oh, that Joe yeah. didn't like. Yeah. Yeah. Too drunk, <laughs> drop too something. Too drunk, drop something. I remember when the time. I, I never got barred. Oh, I did when I walked into the door <laughs> one time, and it was like when I walked in, <laughs> it was like you door? were right to my door, and I had to check it to make sure it's all right, and then you know, you're barred. And I was like, but I don't remember. It's like you don't remember my ass. <laughs> and also remember Christine one time because it was the pub quiz. 
and I think Joe was reading the questions out. Chris was a bit pissed and fell asleep, so he was like asking the question like, in 1955, who was then heard this like <laughs> from Christine had fallen asleep with the head on the bar? So he was like. In 1955, who was that? Christine Yabard? Who was that? Yes. <laughs> he used to do that, yes. Because I'd work, Chris, you've been barred. Just oh, fucking hell. <laughs> and, 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 you know, you talked about coming into the bar. Uh, so if the quiz had, was already underway, then, uh, like, I was on your team several times yeah, well, we because Christine behind, was, like, yeah. off her face or falling yeah. asleep or whatever. So they were, Cliff, Cliff, join yes. us, you know. Like, yes. <laughs> we need somebody. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and the questions were a good mixture. There were was quite a wide selection. Oh, yeah, and it, it, was, it was all kinds of things. It was sports and... Drama and mm. opera and God knows everything was in there, wasn't it? Yeah. It was yeah. yeah, it was it was good. Yeah. yeah. Was it I mean one of the things that um has come up when people talk about difference between bars now and in the past is that there's also venues where you go just for the event. Yes. You know, you go for the act or the whatever. Um whereas the Queen Arms was a mix of evenings where you're just Drinking, chatting, and evenings where there's events and quizzes. What I mean is that right? Or yeah, it was it was a mixture. Hmm. Uh, I think I, I think I would come there whether there was a quiz or not because there's nothing at all in my borough, hmm. so this is like my nearest hangout, and I honestly didn't know a single gay person in my borough. That's why I say it's the gay-free borough yeah. because <laughs> it's like. <laughs> You know. a, a woman I know described Bromley as being like yeah, that. She said, like, oh, that. you know, there, there aren't actually any gays allowed in Bromley. So I think it's that, like, you know, yeah. that's the Bromley. So, but maybe it's that people gravitate in general to the more liberal, well, I don't know, I'll move Well, to. you know, when I, when I move, when I started working with, um, w- with the Harbour Trust, one of my roles was to provide stats to the boroughs, like how many people from each borough have we got registered, etc. And actually, there were a lot of gay people in Brom because Bromley is one of London's largest boroughs, uh, so it's quite spread out, but its population is not as dense as Greenwich or Lewisham. Uh, and then Bexley's like halfway between the two. Uh, but the, the thing is, there are lots of gay people there, and there were lots of HIV positive people there. Um, and then when I, I, I also did a quick survey on um, one of the, is it Squirt or something like that? One of these um, gay uh, apps, for a better word. And what I was trying to do was to put in postcodes and seeing how many people came up so we could target services so I wasn't interested in people's names or anything Mm. I just wanted to know for each postcode how how many people were on the site so we could target outreach services etc because there's Mm. no other stats that like you can't you can find almost everything online from a census for a postcode, but you can't find this. Yeah. So how do you know that these people are there, and how do you get hold of them before they they become HIV positive, to make sure that they take care of themselves? Or I mean, today we might be doing the same for monkey pox or something, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. It's the same process to try and get ahead of whatever you're dealing with. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was really surprised, like Catford and places like that. Um, Catford was one place Dartford was another a lot of gay people Woolwich a lot of lesbians I think it was once called the lesbian capital of London really? Yeah. I never knew that Uh, and then when I kind of thought about it and I remembered the pub that we were talking about in in Woolwich I think it was the infant yeah it did did have another name um for a while. Yeah, and yeah. it became the Woolwich Infant for a bit, I think. Yeah. It, but it was called something else. Something as else. Well. Something that's changed its yeah. name. Uh, and actually, most of the people that went there were lesbians. Okay. So it, it were, and it, it, it kind of was busy, I think, on the Monday. 
uh, and that had to do with wherever they worked or whatever. I don't know what. Mm. Yeah. So it had kind of different timings to the other gay bars and uh, and, and a very different clientele. But maybe Sarah would tell you more about that because uh, Kim definitely. Because she mm. w was involved with that, so yeah. Yeah, I loved yeah. it. Because Kim's, like I said, can we do an interview? And she's like, I'm really busy at the moment, and well, I can't find the time, but I'll try and encourage her to yeah. drop along too. So again, Rosie's going to be on site in the confessional, yeah. uh, in the exhibition space, recording people's I'm sure members. Beverly would mind. I think, yeah, I think. Um, I'll put you in touch. Yeah, I think um, Marcy's actually. Because she, I think she started doing no, taking on some, to do some outreach yeah. for me. I was yeah, like, fantastic. No. no, because these people are all part of Marcy's support circle anyway. Mm. So it'll be good for Marcy to do that. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. So I, I saw she'd done a post talking about this project and saying, contact Paul or myself. And I was like, great. She's just like taking initiative and yeah, good. trying to get her friends to come but to But she her. really needs to feel that she can do something so yeah. this works really well oh, I've got so much she can do because yeah. <laughs> like I said I was saying to her like, I'd like you to be involved in the tea dance project yeah. you know which we want to do over the autumn winter because who was the girl that used to come in and sing the Sade songs I I can't remember her name I remember she was very thin yeah uh, sort of young like, I think she was young young black girl yeah I can't and remember. And she did have a very beautiful voice. Yeah, oh, she was very good, yeah. 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 I remember she was one of the people I think, oh, she's quite good. Yeah. Because there were a couple who were a bit mm. like Rogue. Yes, yeah, yes. I remember. Yeah. I remember there was one black drag queen yeah. who, who sang some great songs, but I mean, oh, she couldn't hold a note for the life of her. <laughs> it was like, oh, okay. <laughs> but you see, again, you see, we're talking about this mixture of uh, queerness and race at the same time in the same venue and yet we don't even know if this girl was queer no it no. didn't really matter no. it was that kind of space mm. so very accepting space i would say yeah yeah i, I always thought it was yeah yeah no, I think well that's... cliff you've given us so much yeah Thank you so much. Right, <laughs> 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 you yes. know, that's all we time. Thank you. <laughs> no, that's brilliant. Thank, Thank you. you. No Thank problem. You.